really? What if, what if there's more Jesus in him that's going to help all of you and it's going to help you too so that, you know, it adds on the Jesus in you so that the Jesus in you will grow up? In the session, Mangaliso Machobani shares about the risk factor in prophecy, false prophets, and how to discern them, the power of prophetic impartation, and he reveals the difference between prophecy, the office of the prophet, and how apostles and prophets are to work together. If you missed part one of the interview, click the link in the description. Let's grow in the prophetic. Yeah, Mangaliso, I, I, I like that the, the, the flow that you spoke of. It starts with a vessel, the, the prayer, right. and then the prayer makes you aware to the frequencies of God. And then we yes. step into the prophetic, right. knowing, realizing what God is doing in the specific situation, sure. and that unlocks the presence of God. Yes. And then ultimately, our goal is we want God. It is the we, does, we want God in the house. Right. Now we spoke about that also, you know, but there's, there, there, it's risk. Sure. <laughs> so unpack that a little bit for us, the, the whole risk component, because a lot of people are like, I want to, uh, it's too risky the way you're ministering, right. you don't even know what you're going to be preaching about. Right, right. But it seems like you're so full of, yeah. you know, the word and God that you, you can just go, but, but yes. talk yeah. about it. I think it is, it is, there is no progress without the risk, even in the world. You know, people tell you go into business. They'll tell you, uh, in fact, the difference between those who make money and those who don't, it's the risk factor. Uh, so let's bring it to spiritual things. The difference between those who really are used by God and those who are just cruising and there's nothing much happening is the faith factor. So it's not really risk, it's faith. It's, it's depending on God. Because self-reliance is the one that says, I want, every, I want to be sure about everything. So you are in control. And as long as you are in control, how much control does God have? You see now, because you are the one maneuvering things. You are the one planning everything. But the moment we go into the faith factor, we jump into, into, Lord, into nothingness. Lord, here I come. <laughs> you know, you better catch me. Then he realizes that you no longer depend on yourself and on your strength. You depend completely on him. And it is that dependency on God that's important. Remember Peter, when he saw Jesus walking on the waters, he said, Master, if it's you, tell me to come. And he said to him, come. He didn't think about it. He just jumped up and walked. And then when he came to his senses, realizing I'm actually walking on the water here, you know, and this is where the problem is. It's coming to our senses, wanting to be in control. We need to realize that we are, we are working with the ancient of days. We are working with a supernatural God. And for us to be able to see the supernatural manifesting, we need to allow supernatural above the natural. It's above the natural to take a risk, to take, you know, to do a, to take out a step, to be in the step of faith. So the prophetic, but these things, Andrew, they're actually natural. It's just that sometimes when something is foreign, it looks risky. But when it is normal, when it has now become normal, I, I call it uh, the rest of the Lord. When you have entered into rest in a particular area in your life, when you've seen God healing people and you've seen, you've, you have a reputation of God healing specific areas of people's lives, you no longer even have faith for it you already know it's going to happen because you've just seen it too many times. Uh, to help people understand that is this. As an adult, you've gone through life. Uh, you've seen which ways turn right and which ways are, are bad ways. A younger person that has no idea, you say to a younger person, don't go that way. There's danger there. Don't, how do you know that? It's like, how do you know that? It's my life. I, and you're like, mm -mm, I know what I'm saying. I've been there. Don't go that way. So you have come to a place of rest. That revelation, that knowledge, that understanding has brought you to understand that this is how things work. You know, the, many, the, the, the exceptions are there, but under normal circumstances, this is how things work. Same things in the spiritual things. You pray. You cannot do anything without prayer. You pray, you connect with God, and the Lord leads you there. And when he leads you there, you allow yourself to go there and you and you go there with no and the first thing you need to know you need to you need to it, fear must go because fear and anxiety are not godly tools they are 
They are, you know, demonic tools. They are, you know, they are natural human tools that hinder what God is doing. So the prophetic all the time, the reason why people don't want to go into the prophetic is, but what if it's my mind? What if, you know, even tongues, what if it's my mind? What if, what if all these things I'm saying, it's not really what God is saying? Well, let's firstly start there. Let's remove the what if, because that's where the problem is. Are you in God or are you not in God? Are you going to trust God or are you not going to trust God? It's like swimming. You know, when, I, when they were teaching me to swim, they told me, trust the water. I said, how do I trust something that is not solid? <laughs> they said, no, that's how, that's what it is. If you trust the water and you allow the water to carry your weight and you just move, you know, you move yourself, you, then the water will carry you, you know. So that's, ex but it's a risk because you can drown. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why when people, when they're drunk and they're not in there and they jump into the water, they cannot do what they need to do because they are too much in control. When we lose control, sounds bad, but when we lose control and we hand over control to God, he begins to run with that and he helps us you yeah, know, that's good. In, in the process. That's good. Yeah. So, I mean, I, th I think often I, my experience is with a lot of people, we're so afraid of failure right. that we don't step out. Sure. And obviously the, the, the journey, the process of growing this, you have to start with baby steps, but you yes. have to, but so fear of failure, how do we... How do we overcome that? Yeah, fear of failure is really self-consciousness. I think that's where it is. We are too conscious of ourselves. What if I fail? What if people say? What if they... So it's all about you. The sooner you take yourself out of the equation and you realize this is not about you, this is about God, it's your deliverance. Get over yourself. Get over yourself. Get yourself out of the way. You know, in fact, this is what you should say to people. Hey, guys, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, great. <laughs> At least we've tried. Let's go for it. It helps everybody. Everybody relaxes. It's like, okay, great. Let's, go. Let's, just, let's just do what God would want us to do. If it works, amen. If it doesn't work, praise the Lord. We've got nothing to lose. We tried, you know. And everybody's relaxed because people are very uptight about my reputation, my name. Really? So you are, this is an idol. In the middle of ministry, we've got idolatry because now it's all about you, how I look, how I'm going to look before the people. This is about God. This is not about you. This is about God. So why, why in the world are you so important that you need to prove to people that I am a man of God? You don't have to prove to anybody. It is God who approves. That's why he even said, this is my son, hear him. God approved Jesus, you know, in that Mount of Transfiguration. He said, this is my son, hear him. He approves us. But we want people to approve us. That's why sometimes, unfortunately, modern ministry is full of selfishness and it's about self-ambition. It's about pride. And we miss the mark. It's no longer even about Jesus because that's another, uh, those are the pitfalls of the prophetic. You know, the pitfalls of the prophetic is that sometimes you can touch so much power, you can be so accurate, and so, that people move their focus away from God and they are looking for the prophet. And, and you need to watch that because people, I mean, really, if you are so accurate, we look for you. It's like that guy is going to tell me exactly. But now, how different is that from the Sangomas now? Hello? You see now? How different is that from the fortune tellers, from the palm readers, from the, you know, the, the, the whatever. So, the, so Because it's now all about going to that guy, going to that man. We need to be careful that the glory belongs to God. That even if God will use us and use us, we always say, who did this? You know, God this. Yes, I'm the vessel, but I'm the vessel so that you focus on God. Because I don't know your stuff. How did I know the stuff? I know. It's because God revealed it to me. And, and this is where we also need to pick up between false prophets and the real prophets. And the difference is not the accuracy. No. Because both of them can be accurate. Both the false prophet and the real prophet can speak the right things that is going on in your life. It's like they really know me. But it's the source that it matters. What is the source of this person? He's speaking from which place? Because you can speak from demonic knowledge or you can speak from godly knowledge and understanding. You understand? So that's why it's, it's not just about, oh, but he's so accurate. He really must be something. No, he could be devilish. You know? That, 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 so you must always discern. So discernment is important. Discerning the source. Discerning the source and knowing who, 
Who is this person? What are they saying? And why are they saying what they are saying? What makes them say what they say? You understand? And discerning that I can, yes, I can. And you see, the Spirit of God is like this. You know, if you put two teaspoons of sugar in your tea every day and somebody puts three for you and they stay, the moment you put it, you, you taste it, it's like, oh, it's too much. You know when it's too little, too much, because there's a certain way you know. They te- when they teach the guys to identify, you know, uh, wrong money notes, they don't teach them the fake. They teach them the real. This is how a correct note looks like. This is how a hundred rand looks like, or a hundred dollars, whichever currency you're using. This is how it looks like. This is the watermark. This is what you look for. So those guys, they only look for, so when they put it under that, you know, uh, ultra blue light, whatever that light is, I don't know what that light is, violet light, whatever it is, they put, they look for the things that they know makes it real. Mm. The same in the prophetic. You put it under, when you discern somebody, you know, prophesy, you are looking for certain things that tell you that this is a true prophetic in ministry. The source, yes. the what. So don't get dazzled by the accuracy. I mean, we've had guys telling us what we ate yesterday. Really, do you want to know what you ate yesterday? Is that important? Really? Don't you know what you ate yesterday? You know, so all phone numbers. We've had lately some fake guys doing phone number things. You know, they'll just call your cell number as is. Your number is this, that, that, that. It's like, oh, how do you know that? It's like, really? Why is that important? You know, there's many ways of getting your number. I could get everybody who attended and go through the cell phone list and just pick up certain people. There's, you know, we yeah, don't so do need, that. So we need to be aware. We of... have to be, uh, not every prophetic is from God. Yeah, and so also what you're highlighting is that as fivefold ministers, but especially also in the prophetic, we sure. should not be drawing people to ourselves. Yes. We must draw people to Christ. Exactly. So I love what you're saying. It's like we must, we must give glory yes. to the Lord. If it works, obviously if it, when we do something it doesn't work, hey, I'll own it. Yes. But when it when it's accurate and when it's, you know, a manifestation of God's power and, and, and prophecy, it is for his glory. It is for his glory. And then obviously, I mean, with fi- the fivefold ministers there to equip the saints. Yes. So the prophet's not supposed to hear for you. Uh-huh. They are there to equip you to hear from God yourself. Exactly. To activate you. Yeah, to activate to you. Activate. And people it, must be reminded of it. You know, we're not, we're not in the Old Testament anymore yes. where there's only the prophet hears. Every New Testament believer can now can hear, hear exactly. from God. And that's how you know that this is a New Testament prophet. A real prophet because he's always interested in activating you it's called impartation after you've heard just like what i shared about the healing after i said under that guy's healing ministry i went out and stuff was starting to happen i was like oh really what does what does this mean it's impartation so true prophets the fivefold minister or ministry is there to activate the body remember it's for the equipping of the saints the edification of the saints you know until we all come to the fullness of the of the, of the man called Christ Jesus. Mm. So it's not about, uh, it's a, not a celebrity ministry, you know. I'm the prophet. The prophet has come to town. You know, you, you, you see some, some of the stuff that people do, like the prophet, don't touch the prophet. The prophet is like, really? We are all prophetic. Mm. Just chill. Yes. You know, yeah. we are all prophetic. They're just no big deal. We actually are all supposed to prophesy. The Bible says so, you know, we, we all, says we can all prophesy, <laughs> you know, we can all prophesy in the sense of we all can speak the word of God. We all can, and a healthy church must have a healthy level of the prophetic, everybody. So I can pick up stuff from you that, are you fine? You know, I just saw you in a dream and the Lord showed me this. Hey, yes, you know, and I prayed for you. Oh, great. Now, it's like we are edifying each other. We don't even need the pastor to come. Because we are so sensitized. All of us are picking a word. I had a word this morning. This is a word for you. Whatever. As we come together, we minister one to another. The body is growing. We're not waiting for the prophet. You know, we we are just beginning to minister one. We are building each other up. As each, you know, part builds the other. That for me is very And as the scriptures say, you know, each one, as we when we gather, each one brings a song or a word or a, an, it, it, you know, edify one another. Yes. So it should be everybody coming together and, and ministering to one another and everyone has something to give. Right. You know, so which is beautiful. And of course you test. 
You don't take everything. That's how we te- that's why we do prophetic schools to say test every word, but don't be critical, don't be negative. Test. There's a difference. By test we mean assess what the word is saying, weigh it in the spirit. Don't just outright reject it just because it's not tinkling your your emotions, you know? It's like somebody prophesying, saying to you, God is going to open a ministry in New York City. It's like, oh, hallelujah, I hear God, I receive the Lord. But if he says God is going to open a ministry in your life, you know, in 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 some village in the Bundus, in, in, you are like, I bind you, Satan, get behind me. It's the same spirit. It's because they're not telling us the stuff we want to hear. That's another thing. We need to be careful that when we listen to the prophetic, we don't only listen out for the things that tickle our ears. Because sometimes you may be, you may miss everything else. But just you, you, you are very choosy. You only you only take the stuff that, that that you know, and this is where the ministry of prophets come in. This is where the office of a prophet, for me, the difference is there. That prophets who are off who are prophet by, by calling of God, not just prophetic, but prophets by calling of God, they know how to rebuke and how to align the church. They'll give you a strong rebuke that is still helping you, you know, and you, you won't be offended because you, you receive it graciously because you understand I'm being aligned. So it's not only nice things. Let's, let's say that because it's important. We're not only prophesying nice stuff, you know, as though we, we are playing a game here. We are, but a true prophet will also bring rebuke, will also bring correction. But that rebuke and correction will still be in the spirit of edification, comfort, and exhortation. It's not going to be in the spirit of cursing and judging and breaking you down. That's how you know you've met a New Testament prophet. You know, It's when you are still built up, even when you are rebuked. So don't say, that word is so negative, I can't take it. Uh, listen to what, is there a correction? Is there something God is trying to align you to? You know, And we teach people who prophesy how to bring a word, even if God shows you a very serious stuff about the person. Bring it in a way that helps them. You know, Don't bring it in the way that exposes them and condemns them because they're not going to come out of their built up. Mm, that's good. Yeah. The way you bring it, you must know how to bring it. So God expects you. God will give you the raw stuff, but he expects you as an artisan, as, a, as an expert, as a, as a prophetic minister to know how to usher that word still without compromising the weight of the message, but still bringing it in such a way that when the person comes out of there, they come out corrected, not condemned. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's Very good. important. And I mean, ultimately, we're looking for more of Jesus. Yes. And the prophetic minister brings another aspect of Jesus. And if, if having more of Jesus is a rebuke or a correction to realign, to get your life in order, then that's freedom. That's beautiful. That's, exactly. It's not condemning. It's no. more of Jesus, yes. which is wonderful. Okay, so um, apostolic and prophetic. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the interaction. Yes. How does, how does, how, you know, I mean, I mean, parts of the body of Christ don't embrace apostles and prophets. They mm. maybe only pastors and teachers and sometimes evangelists. Sure. So apostles and prophets, why is it still for today? Right. And then let's unpack a little bit the interaction between them. Yes. If, if we believe the scripture that says, and he gave some to be apostles, teachers, pastors, prophets, and, and apostles, we should believe that as he gave evangelists, and teachers and pastors, he also gave up because it's in the same verse. Why would we select? Why would we say these ones? You know, because it's what we call them cessationists. You know, these ones stopped, they seized during the days of the apostles, and the other ones continued. Really, where does the Bible say that? The Bible doesn't tell us this one ceased, this one continued. It's us in our own little minds and not understanding that. You know, God can still release apostles today. So apostles and prophets are still there today because. We still need them for the foundation. The Bible says we are built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets and Christ being the chief cornerstone. And of course, that scripture could be referring even to the ministry of the prophets as in the Old Testament covenant and the apostles in the New Testament because they play a role. So we are basically built upon the scriptures, (laughs) you know, prophets and apostles, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, and Christ being the chief, being the center of both covenants. That, for me, is a key understanding of how we must understand the apostolic and the prophet. And they work together because they are both foundational. They have to be in the system. They Because you need to pioneer. How do you start something? You started by pioneering. Not everybody's a pioneer because pioneers must must open the territory, must, you know, must, you, you have to do a lot of breaking of big stones, opening a road, 
It takes different equipment and building. So you need apostles for pioneering and you need prophets for bringing in the flow in the whole system because apostles can be very structured but but prophets bring the flow they bring the life they bring it's like a river and its banks type of a thing you know the river is the prophetic the banks is the apostles we need that structure because the apostles alone can become legalistic if you leave them on their own it can be so structured to the t that we don't even have the flow of the spirit in this whole thing because it's just so structured. This is how we do it, it's how we've always done it. But when the apostle comes in with the prophet and he allows the prophetic ministry, they also allow alignment in their own lives, the flow of the presence of God. Prophets alone also, without the apostles, can be quite goofy and spooky and see things every time, you know, and be in be in you know in the up in the sky without landing. And apostles always have a way of bringing prophets into so we need both we need both the prophetic and the apostolic and I've seen how they both work so beautifully in the body of Christ to bring balance even in the body of Christ and unfortunately because of ignorance we've used them against each other you find that people who are very prophetic are misunderstood in the body of Christ as and they are misunderstood by people who are very apostolic you know, who are very structured and very systematic and logical. They say, no, no, we don't want this goofy, flaky stuff. This is not God. And then people who are prophetic also say, you are legalistic. You are too structured. So or too controlling. Or too controlling. Mm. That's it. Because sometimes apostles can be quite, the systems, the systems can require them to work such a thing that, you know, it's it sounds controlling. I want to be free in the spirit. So you need the combination of both. And it grows the church better, you know, when both of them are involved in the ministry. And so when you've got apostles who are prophetic, it, it's even better. You know, and when you've got prophetic apostles, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's great because then... And apostles and prophets were also apostolic. It's great because then they understand that, hey, I am limited to a certain extent. I need, you know, apostles in my life. I need prophets in my life to be able to balance. You always have to have that team in place for something to be accurate, you know, and to flow and to flow naturally. So, oh, that's yes. Good. That's good. Because we tend to, I mean, you touched on it. We tend to, as you say, the apostles judge the prophets and the prophets judge the apostles. We, we tend to do it with all the fivefold. We, yeah. we tend to miss what the other one carry. Right. And um, so how can we grow in cultivating yes. appreciation for the, the different gifts? I what always say? say it's because we have to understand where all the gifts come from. They come from one man. It's Christ. Remember the Bible says he gave some. He so there's so these these gifts are not coming from everywhere. They're coming from one person, Christ, the source. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be teachers, some to be evangelists, mm. for the edification of the body. Ephesians chapter four. So you need to understand that as he gave some, he gave gifts to man. He he brought it's his personality given to all of us. So we must understand this is one man. Christ is the head. We are the body. So. It's firstly the source is one, and therefore it's only it's one person. So we can't divide Christ into different pieces. He's one man. We are dividing him. No, I'm only the evangelist. You know, the thing of Apollos and Paul. You know, some are of Apollos, some are of Paul. We are of Christ. We are all of Christ, you know. So it was there even in the New Testament church where people saw the grace that Apollos carried of teaching, you know, being and Paul was more of a pioneer, you know, and they wanted to be grounded more than but we needed both. We needed both that ability to ground them in teaching and the ability to pioneer and to stretch them in the vision. So we need each other. It's called maturity. That's why the Bible says, until we all come to the maturity of faith, not the unity of faith, you know, not, not the unity of doctrine, but the unity of faith. And that's important, you know, because sometimes we may not be united in doctrine, but we are united in faith, meaning we are matured enough to recognize that I need Andre because Andre operates in healing ministry in this I need that in my life because I don't know how to tap into that. So as I interact with Andre, I begin to pick up the frequency and I start doing what I need to do. You understand? And Andre says, there's something I need in this man. I see his ability to preach, his ability to minister. This is how Christ is expressed. We can't see the fullness of Christ when we operate in a dimension. We need to operate in the fullness of the fivefold ministry 
And of course, I understand that sometimes we will not have all the five in the church, but that's the ideal. The ideal is to be able to have all the five graces operating in the body of Christ. And the people operating the fivefold graces may not necessarily be leaders. Sometimes you may have an evangelist who's not even in the leadership, but who's really gifted in that evangelistic anointing. We must recognize the gift of God upon their lives and support it and actually bring that person to impart into our lives. So if you don't have it, outsource it. It's the body of Christ. If you don't have the prophetic gift in your church, outsource it. Bring a prophet in to train the people, to prophesy, yes, stir the people, but also to activate them to prophesy, activate them to evangelize. So each pastor must remember, remember pastor is a shepherd, the shepherd of the house, because a pastor can have a grace gift that's also different, can have an apostolic gift, a prophetic gift, etc. They must discern what is lacking in their congregation. And they must go find it to say, if I can't have it among my people, I must look for that grace gift to add. A good pastor will have the variety of the fivefold ministry always touching the house. Not because you can't do it, but because you realize sometimes people receive better from another gift. The stuff you've been saying for 20 years, they don't hear you because there's also familiarity and other things. But also your grace gift is they are used to your grace gift. But as somebody else brings a different dimension, they begin to connect better. They begin to hear it better. So we need to mature, uh, Pastor Andre. I think that's for me is the key. Our intolerance of one another's gifts shows our immaturity as the body of Christ. It's childishness. It's immaturity. Until we mature, we will never see the fullness. When we mature, we will see the fullness where I'm able to submit my gift under your gift to say, right now, Andre is the one ministering. Let me receive from him. He's, I, I need that anointing. That's good. It's very important. And when it's my turn, I will minister whatever God ministers and Andre will be able to receive from me. That submission one to another, that is the next level. It will take us to the next level, Andre. Yeah. Right now, we are divided by our own uh, really it's pride. You know, the bottom line is really pride because we are afraid. Uh, what if they, what if, what if he's more anointed than me? Really? What if, what if there's more Jesus in him that's going to help all of you and it's going to help you too so that, you know, it adds on the Jesus in you so that the Jesus in you will grow up so that we all have one big Jesus. How, why can't we see it that way? Why can't we see that? That man is going to make me better. That woman is going to make Oh, the women, that's another story now. We shouldn't go there. You know, because we don't even receive ministry from women. You know, let alone, let alone gifts, just even gender. That's how carnal we become. It's like, I can't receive that. She's a woman. I can't receive that. Ma- really? Show me a female spirit and show me a male spirit. How do they look like? I wonder. There's nothing like that. It's the same spirit. You understand? A child can minister out of a grace gift of an, of, of an apostle. A child. Because you don't have to be 50 years old and above for you to be an apostle. You know, some guys have got, have got it figured it out with age. It's like, really? You know, you've got to be old, have some beers, and be 50, and then you can call yourself an apostle. No, it's a grace. It's a grace. So young people can be apostles. We forget that Jesus was a youth. And chances are his apostles were probably his peers. And they're probably around the 30s or so. (laughs) You understand? So these are young people basically operating in giftings. So there are certain stereotypes in a nutshell that we have uh, that block us from understanding the fullness of God. We're doing the stereotypes of church stereotypes, molds uh, that hinder us from experiencing the fullness of God. The sooner we grow up and mature, God is going to help us to see how all the graces interact and work together. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think what you touch on there is the immaturity. Yeah. Immaturity manifests in we rather judge one another. Sure. And we don't receive from one another. But maturity means humility. Aha. And it means I can receive from the different, even though it looks different, right. functions different. Right. And I love what you're saying. If the Lord anoints a woman or a young person, if there's an anointing on their lives, I want more of Jesus. Exactly. <laughs> we will receive from them. Yes. And it's beautiful. So I, I, I agree. We, we need to be 
We need to embrace humility right. because the enemy has divided the body of Christ and therefore we are pow powerless. We're missing out on the fullness of Christ. Yes. So through humility and maturity, we can embrace the full body of Christ right. and ultimately have more of Jesus. Absolutely. Have more of Jesus in our churches and in our lives, which is, which is what that is what we're looking for. Exactly. Amen.